So good afternoon, everybody. Nice to have you here all. Uh, today we are going to have a discussion about uh, connecting and securing services um, across hybrid and multi-cloud. And today I have a nice set of colleagues and guys to really talk to each other. So let me start uh, by a quick introduction from myself and from the team as well. Uh, so my name is Rania Mohammed. I'm a solution architect in Google. Um, I have the passion towards the service mesh, uh, SOA, integration, uh, digital transformation, and uh, I'm super into the multi-cloud and the hybrid cloud story. Christian, please. Yeah. My name is Christian Hüning. I'm uh, from Germany, Hamburg, and um, I'm in the cloud native space since 2016, 2015, roughly, doing uh, mostly private cloud setups uh, since that time. Been working at the university uh, first, actually building up a compute cloud there for research, and then uh, moved over to the finance industry, where I um, spun up the past five years. Uh, I led the team to uh, create a bare metal cluster first, and then switched that over to a multi cluster hybrid cloud setup across GCP, AWS, and uh, vSphere OpenStack setups. Um, and now, just very recently, switched over to the defense sector. So we're now working on uh, doing the same roughly on a larger scale for the uh, IT service provider of the German Armed Forces, BWI. Peter? Uh, my name is Piotr Cześniak. I work at Google. I'm engineering manager managing uh, GKE Kubernetes networking team. I'm based in Warsaw in Poland. Um, I consider myself a Kubernetes veteran. I joined like this project in January 2015, so like before it was popular, at least such popular, probably like there was number of users back then was like comparable to the size of the audience in this one specific talk. Uh, and two years ago, I switched, I was working in the various areas of these projects. Two years ago, I switched to networking space, uh, managing the, the teams there. So I'm quite new to networking space. I still consider myself on the learning curve and yeah. Thank you, Peter. Ricardo? All right, so I'm next. I'm Ricardo. I'm a computer engineer at CERN. Um, I've been at CERN for a long time. I joined initially to help develop what we call the grid computing infrastructure we have, and I was a software developer for storage systems and computing systems. But uh, with time, uh, there was a lot more interest in big data and large-scale uh, infrastructures with the cloud appearing. So the focus at CERN kind of changed from building our own systems to collaborating in these sort of communities like uh, Kubernetes and previously OpenStack as well. Um, and since 2015, I've been doing uh, Kubernetes as well internally. Um, and um, I'm responsible for some of the platforms we have for containers, Kubernetes, for different services. Also do a bit of machine learning, uh, where things get really interesting for us in terms of uh, doing hybrid clouds to get access to, to accelerators that we don't have on-premises necessarily. So that's it. The, these days, this is mostly what I've been working on. Thank you, Ricardo. Last but not least, Ronald, please. Hello, my, uh, my name is uh, Roland Kahl. I work at uh, Ball.com. I've been there for 10 years uh, as a system engineer. Uh, Ball.com is uh, an, uh, the biggest online, uh, online retailer in the Netherlands and a very well-known brand. Um, I started uh, 10 years ago, we worked on our data center and uh, about five years ago we started also moving uh, workloads into uh, the cloud and I've been working on, on that ever since and especially connecting the, uh, the two uh, uh, because yeah, we have a hybrid environment, so there's lots, lots of challenges there that we had to solve. Thank you, Ronald. So, uh, as we speak about hybrid and multi-cloud, Ronald, would you share with us your point of view um, uh, about the top two and three uh, or three network and security challenges for the multi and the hybrid cloud, please? Yes, so, um, on the a, on a network, related uh, challenge that we that we faced is that uh, in our data center we had a, a lot of technologies uh, uh, deployed for load balancing uh, it was already quite a yeah quite complicated and then we moved to uh, some of our workloads to gcp and then gcp introduced a whole new set of load balancing technologies and 
with every technology that we introduce, we also introduce new naming, DNS naming conventions. And so for our developers, uh, it became pretty hard to understand which naming conventions to use to reach which servers, uh, et cetera. So that was one, big of, one of the big challenges that we, uh, that we had to solve. And uh, on the security level, uh, the problems that we there uh, have is um, that in the data center, a lot of the uh, uh, connectivity is uh, protected using IP-based security, right? Uh, the firewalls, uh, IP-based. Uh, that works if all the workloads have a static IP, because then you can you know, identify them, et cetera. But, but uh, in GCP, and especially in Kubernetes, uh, pods have ephemeral IPs. Uh, they change all the time. And uh, securing that properly, uh, with, uh, mixing those two, that, that was a real challenge uh, for us. So uh, Ricardo, what do you think? I mean, what are the challenges from your point of view? Right. Uh, maybe I'll focus more on the networking part, uh, sure. being like a, a research lab, our, our data is kind of, um, we, we even publish a lot of our data as open data. Mm -hmm. uh, so the networking challenges are, are complicated for us. Uh, we, we don't run uh, most, like when we go hybrid, it, the goal is more to run the workloads, not, money, not, not so much right now to run services. And in this part, the challenge is really to, to stay flexible in the choices of clouds, uh, but also regions. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen when we try to burst for things like GPUs that we don't have the capacity or the types of accelerators we need in all the regions necessarily. Mm -hmm. So being flexible in being able to get resources from different regions or even clouds is quite important. Also for specialized accelerators, this is the case. So this is kind of a challenge because uh, we, we also need to move all around lots of data. So often we need to peer with these regions to have fast networking and dedicated networking. And uh, matching this with the flexibility we want to achieve is not necessarily easy. The other challenge we have, which is networking, but also cost related uh, associated to that, which is we have workloads that generate a lot of data. A single job can generate multiple tens of terabytes. And often we have to bring that data back. And uh, uh, clouds are very good at uh, egress costs uh, um, and charging those. So when you have to bring the, the, the data back, uh, this has to be carefully managed and negotiated. It's not necessarily networking, but it's somehow related as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. Peter, what do you think? So with the shift from data centers on premises to cloud and multi-cloud and, and hybrid environment, the problems didn't disappear. They just moved to some other place, and the problems are there. So from we moved like you know from cables and wires and connecting computers to connecting like you know data centers. Uh, we moved from uh, securing like you know the data center from the external world to some extent to securing us like you know connection between those data centers uh, from typically local, fully controlled, um, consistent environment to uh, distributed heterogeneous infrastructure uh, that is like, you know, not fully controlled by the users. Like, you know, as a user, like you have limited capabilities to control, like, you know, what's going in the cloud providers places. And last but not least, like, you know, the applications from like, you know, being collocated, being uh, coupled with themselves, like move to a very distributed model where like, you know, they are running across the whole world. Thank you, Piotr. And Christian, what uh, would be your thoughts? I would say all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe a bit uh, what I, or what we found was that in the finance sector, you often have to do with like, okay, we uh, have to talk to and connect to banks that have, um, source IP-based routing and these kind of things, but also setting up uh, Kubernetes the same way, or kind of the same way in, in, in these various providers. The networking always works a bit different, especially when you have these requirements with egress and how that works, or uh, different AZs if you went to, to regional clusters. So it was in that area. And then also, of course, the, um, I mean the usual um, latency aspect, what to put where, 
Can we use services in one area or one region of the world and reuse them by the other deployments and all these considerations? And of course, naming, but we could talk about that later, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, in a sense of that, and based on your experience, how do we, uh, or how should we, secure and govern the communication between services running in multiple clusters, or even running in distributed and different infrastructure? Yeah, for us this was the case with, um, I mean, we had a, a talk at the beginning of this week by my colleague Caroline about how we did monitoring in the end, so we decided to go with a service mesh um, a solution based on Linkerd, so we used their cluster mesh technology because we said exposing all of these things to the internet or using something that would connect all these clouds, also OpenStack, also vSphere, also the bare metal setup, wasn't really feasible, so we needed this connecting technology that would be the same in all of these uh, areas, that has a shared trust anchor, that has a shared identity framework that mm -hmm. you can use to say this is all that we talk to, and it also has good latency. So that's why uh, we then in the end decided to um, use that approach, where we also were able to find granular, say, we want the, the communication only go in this direction, but not back. So in the end, that was the example, yeah. we would use a singular Grafana at the central cluster, and then as an example, just connect to the Prometheus and the other clusters, and use that for short-term observability. Um, but we would also stream data or use services in the other clusters. And the framework allowed us to, with their policies and all that, to selectively also prevent that a certain um, customer request in Germany would reach a cluster in, yeah, let's say, Spain. Um, and that allowed us to do that, yeah. Thank you, Christian. Um, Peter, what would be your thoughts? So service mesh, like, you know, LinkedIn is a natural choice, like, you know, my colleagues will be talking, I guess, about Istio, uh, is a natural choice for such a situation. So I'd like to bring maybe one more solution that is available in Kubernetes, uh, which is like gateway, Kubernetes gateway API and the gateway implementation, uh, in particular, a multi-cluster gateway that is built on top of like uh, multi-cluster service there. So Gateway API is like a portable solution that like, you know, in Kubernetes there is like a unified uh, implementation, uh, unified like a definition, unified like API, and then like, you know, various cloud providers, various um, vendors are providing their custom implementation of this Gateway API, but like, you know, using the same API you can apply applications across multiple platforms. It's uh, role-oriented, so it allows, like, you know, it's, it's designed in a way that is taking into account both the needs of the cluster operation, administrator, infrastructure operator, as well as the user. Uh, and it's very, uh, it's, it's very rich when it comes, like, you know, to the features it offers. Uh, it's, it supports, for example, like, you know, more sophisticated way of balancing uh, on the API level. Uh, it, it, it supports uh, HTTP header matching, for example, like many other features that are there. This is like the next generation of Ingress that is like, you know, um, sort of L7 standard in the Kubernetes world. Uh, and when it comes like, you know, to its status, currently it's more like multi-cluster within one platform, but like, you know, there is you know, it's, it's, it's relatively new projects and like I'm, I'm pretty sure that over years it will be evolving to support also like, you know, multi-cloud and hybrid use cases. Thank you, Peter. What about you, uh, record? Uh, Ricardo? Sorry. I would actually second what he, Peter just said, which is uh, the, the challenges are there for multi-cluster as well. Um, and the, problem, the problems we've been facing are related to to not having an easy way to express what we are used to express within one cluster, like our back or namespaces or all these network policies across multiple clusters and defining these policies in, a, in, a, in the ways we are used to, which means um, there's different projects building additional things on top, uh, which pose pr um, problems to everyone because yeah. it's another layer to maintain and yeah. to, to express the same policies and more error prone. So I think standardizing somehow the multi-cluster situation will, will help a lot in this area, also for hybrid clouds as well. Yep. Yep. Thank you. What about you, Ronald? 
Uh, I think that what uh, Chris said uh, for us, uh, uh, introducing the service mesh was a solution to uh, ensuring that we had a, a more consistent security model across our hybrid setup. Uh, in our case, we used Istio, and uh, uh, we have a lot of autonom autonomous teams that are responsible ma for managing their uh, security of their own servers. So the Istio authorization policies, for example, they, they have to configure them themselves. And mm -hmm. uh, we have some guardrails in place using OPA Gatekeeper to ensure that they uh, configure proper authorization policies and don't accidentally open up their servers for the whole uh, company, etc. You know, it can happen. Okay. So uh, I think, yeah, that is for us, uh, the Istio Service Mesh um, uh, allowed us to move away from IP-based uh, uh, access uh, towards a more uh, identity-based access. Yeah. Thank you. So maybe, Rod, you can um, walk us through the, um, um, how to manage and communicate the communication, the traffic, the connection between services. Uh, and this is based on what you have been experiencing in bot.com. In order to really manage such a thing in multi-cluster, running in different, again, uh, and distributed infrastructure, like the hybrid or the multi-cloud story. Yeah. So. Um like I touched upon in the, in the first question, um, we had a, a lot of different load balancing technologies, mm -hmm. uh, and that made it really hard for users to, you know, to figure out how to configure the service to connect to the right service. Mm -hmm. um, so um, we have introduced a, uh, a new naming convention that will actually apply to uh, to our service mesh. We're not using the Kubernetes service names, but we actually use some kind of alias. But that alias works across uh, our Kubernetes environment, but also in our data center. So it doesn't really matter where the service runs, just the name stays the same. And if the service moves from the data center to, to the, the cloud, the name stays the same. So no more changes to, uh, to dependencies, I oh, I need, my, need to change my host name, et cetera. So uh, the service mesh allowed us to do that, and that this was a very powerful uh, feature for it. Yeah. Thank you, Ronald. What about you, Ricardo? Yeah, so. Um, I mentioned that we, we don't have the traditional service deployments, um, and this has been, uh, there's a lot of focus on service mesh. For us, um, what we want to offer is, is kind of uh, hide the complexity of multi-cluster, multi-cloud for our users, but we are deploying workloads uh, yeah. that run large, large amount of jobs and things like this. So from, yeah, since a few years, we've been looking at multiple uh, ideas for this. We've tested what was called Federation View One, uh, we tried, which was really nice uh, API similar to Kubernetes, but it had a lot of limitations. Then there was V2, which was maybe over complex for what we wanted to achieve, and needed a lot of uh, customization to be able to use that. There are projects like Admiralty. We actually implemented internally. Uh, if you've heard of the virtual Kubelet, yeah. uh, we actually implemented a backend that would talk to Kubernetes API behind, and we would hide behind a virtual node full Kubernetes clusters that were running in the cloud. All of these things um, it, it, we've been trying uh, to, to do. I think the path that is being followed now, which is this idea of having also cluster mesh in addition to the service mesh and some sort of gateway between the, for the hybrid co connectivity, um, that's, that's something we are looking forward to test uh, further this year, and uh, hopefully this will be the last, uh, last, one, last one we have to go through before we have the, the, dream, the dream deployment. Thank you, Ricardo. What about you, Pietro? So maybe I will echo to, to what you said uh, you know, in the previous topic, like you know, uh, network policy is important aspect here in addition to the network policy that is like supported on the uh, service mesh la uh, layer. There is also like, you know, L4 network policy that is uh, defined in the open source Kubernetes that is supported, for example, by, by Cilium. So from my perspective, from, from Google Cloud, like we are offering like, you know, network policy as a part of data plane D2. Uh, that is our implement, uh, our like, you know, Cilium. Uh, solution for, for GKE. Thank you, Peter. What about you, Christian? Um, we also found that the uh, the network policy 
problem it was actually interesting when implementing that with the built-in policies it was really hard to do and also uh, to expose that to developers so we were really um, curious about especially now the new uh, API uh, the new gateway API policies that come along um, also with the new Linkerd release we didn't get to try that out but it, it looks promising so I would look at that the other thing that um, Service-wise was interesting that um, the open banking stack we deployed, it was capable of being multi-tenant, but also some customers demanded to have that isolated, so a dedicated stack. And um, this whole new multi-cluster and hybrid cloud setup allowed us to very distinctively adhere to the specific requirements of the customers, while at the same time reducing cognitive load for the teams by centralizing certain components or control planes and not duplicate them anymore. And that's where the service mesh then also helped a lot to have these specific connections. Thank you, Christian. So, um, uh, Ronald, uh, would you uh, please share with us the experience of Bell.com for the usage of the custom resource definitions and config connector, and how did that help in the imp implementing the self-service? Um, yeah, I can. Um, so, for those who are familiar with Istio, uh, it has, an, uh, has a component called Egress Gateway. And uh, we use that for uh, uh, filtering all the outbound traffic mm -hmm. and, uh, and making sure that uh, certain applications are, a are able to reach a certain external party while others are not. Um, but the Egress Gateway, it's a shared component. Uh, so there's lots of communication going in there. And uh, naturally, we're, we're not allowing uh, individual teams to make modifications to the configuration. So. Um, uh, I've introduced a custom resource definition, which, which we call external site, which a, uh, a team can uh, request or can add to their um, infrastructure uh, repository. Mm -hmm. um, the external site resource in itself does nothing, uh, but it, 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 it um, provides some kind of metadata for, the, for another process to generate the egress configuration uh, egress gateway configuration based on the external sites. But there's another part in, involved here. External sites are, uh, need to be approved by our security team uh, because of compliance reasons and making sure that no uh, data is exposed to uh, third parties, etc. Um, so the, the security team, uh, team needs to create an um, external site approval or a custom resource, and those two are linked, so there's a controller behind them that makes sure that once the approval is there, that the status gets to approved, and once a, an external site is approved, the configuration is generated. This is all uh, done automatically. Um, so the, the team all, only needs to go to the security, say, I need uh, access to this site, and that's it. And uh, we, as a, we used to be in, uh, also in this flow. Uh, we had to actually do the, the work for them to make sure that they could do the external the external configuration was set up, but that's uh, now done automatically using uh, custom resource and controllers. Super, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, maybe Ricardo, would you please share with us the challenges that Turn has been facing or is facing in integrating HPC workloads with cloud native workloads, especially in distributed uh, cloud? Yeah, so I'm happy. I'm, I'm always happy to talk about that. Um, it, it's not specific to CERN. It's really uh, In general, yeah. research workloads, actually. Uh, there's we, we run, I always advertise this, we, we, I also help out uh, with the research end user group in the CNCF. So if you have similar requirements, uh, you're happy. Uh, we're happy to, to have more people helping. Uh, the, I think the main problem has been that Kubernetes was focused always uh, from the start very much on services. The job API had uh, some limitations and was very specific for one type of job. Uh, so the scheduler uh, is also lacking some of the features that traditional HPC workloads would require, like uh, um, queues or, or the ability to co-schedule workloads, gang scheduling, things like this, fair share. Uh, these are limitations that are uh, kind of important. Um, and this is really more Kubernetes uh, related. If we start looking at, um, at uh, using cloud resources, the main problematic is a lot of these workloads need a lot of data. Uh, and specifically, if we're talking about hybrid deployments, uh, moving data around can, can be 
complicated. Their gravity is, is a real thing. For some of uh, the research users, and specifically CERN, we actually built mechanisms on top to deal with this in a good way. For the traditional HPC workloads, they are really focused on uh, like a supercomputer uh, with data locality, and this makes it harder to, to go hybrid as well. Uh, so I think that's, that's a big challenge. That is not Kubernetes specific, it's more the hybrid, uh, hybrid part. Thank you, Ricardo. So, uh, Piotr, would you please share with us how do you uh, and Google envision the ability and the benefits of, and the challenges to cross, uh, to charge back uh, workloads running in hybrid and multi-cloud? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So, um, to explain maybe what chargeback means, chargeback is an ability to allocate the infrastructure cost to, you know, some specific workloads or some specific applications. I think, like, you know, this is super important for many companies. Uh, I can see like two use cases here. One use case is uh, attributing like, you know, uh, mapping like, you know, the cost to the service to the application and mapping to a specific user that owns these applications. So this is like for internal budgeting purposes. And then like the second use case is like for the companies that are building SaaS solutions on top of Kubernetes. Uh, where you want, like, you know, to attribute the, when they want to attribute the cost of a running application to some specific uh, user of their. Uh, in, in, in both cases, this is like, you know, the solution is, uh, like, you know, the problem is quite challenging. So there is, uh, you know, plenty of the questions that, that needs to be answered up front, like how to attribute those costs, like, you know, is this about, like, do you want to cover, like, the actual usage or, like, what is requested? Uh, do you want to, um, uh, like, what to do with, like, the spare capacity that nobody uses this? And, um, for example, like, internally at Google, we have a very advanced economy behind that. Uh, in the... In the ecosystem, there is multiple solutions. The cloud ecosystem, the Kubernetes ecosystem, there is like multiple solutions in that space, fortunately, that are addressing those problems. So um, like Cast AI, KubeCost, to name a few, um, cloud providers, like for example, uh, GCP offers us their custom solutions, like uh, we have like GKE cost allocation. Uh, why do we want to care about that? Uh, one of the one of the um, reasons is like uh, cost allocation, cost, cost attribution is like the first step for the cost optim optim optimization, and you know probably this is like one of the most hot topics these days when it comes like you know to the infrastructure, the cost of the infrastructure, giving the you know macroeconomic situations in in which we are all operating. Super, thank you, Piotr. Uh, Christian, can you give us your thoughts there, please? My thoughts, yeah. Maybe uh, two things. The one thing with multi-cluster that um, was, I think, a very good thing for the company was that it allowed us to, if you take Kubernetes as the foundational layer for everything, um, which we did early on, even on bare metal, um, and you base your entire stack on it, and then you find a way, like Carpi, or in our case, we use, um, I mean, the cluster API. In our case, we used SAP Gardener, which is a tool that uh, kind of does, yeah, not exactly the same, but it's in the same realm. Um, then you suddenly have the opportunity to really deploy your stack to wherever the customer wants it. So we had a customer that said, I want it on AWS, and we said, okay. Then we deployed this onto AWS into their provided account. Um, that was a, a very good thing, and a very surprising thing for us, which we just didn't really think about, was that um, by creating all these clusters and all these environments and spreading them around and ha having somehow to come up with names for that, we totally f forgot that uh, we had other teams, like the support teams, for instance, that would look into tools like Kibana and Elastic and, and other things. Um, all of a sudden had to deal with all these names and where data originated from. So there was a whole bunch of organizational changes needed in the processes behind that when going from what we essentially had as a big bare metal multi-tenancy cluster setup to this hybrid multi-cluster world um, that we overlooked a bit. So that would be a word of advice to take that into account early on that you have to also take all these other departments with you on that journey. Thank you, Christian. Ronald, what are your thoughts? Uh, on the costs? Uh, yeah, yeah. 
on the cost part, yeah, um, we are very cost conscious uh, yes. currently uh, <coughs> with our cloud spend. Uh, we have a we have a budget and a, a target budget. So okay, this is the spend for this year, and we need to we try to stay within the budget, of course. Uh, uh, we we have a lot of metrics uh, collected to see uh, uh, which team is using uh, which resources and what those resources are costing them. Uh, we try to find anom anomalies. Uh, uh, if, if huge uh, spends in costs are detected, then teams are uh, informed, say, what, uh, and asked, okay, what, what, what's going on? Uh, did you make a mistake in your big query, for example, or uh, have you spun up too many pods, things like that? Um, so yeah, for us that's uh, that's an uh, important uh, part of uh, of cloud, uh, the insights in the costs and all the the shared infrastructure that we operate. Um, um, for example, uh, not gateways and, 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 and traffic that flows between uh, the different uh, different Kubernetes clusters and the Kubernetes cluster itself. Those you know those costs are uh, spread over the over the teams. And if possible, uh, based on the ratio, so on use. But yeah, if it's not possible, then we just divide it by the number of teams. Super. Thank you, Raoul. So, um, Christian, would you please share with us uh, what kind of operation changes are requested from our organization aspect in a multi-cloud or a hybrid cloud environment? Yeah, I think I did that. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, but I mean, uh, what I said essentially is these changes in the other departments that um, you really have to ramp up. That um, multi-cloud uh, consciousness naming was really a hard problem for us. We even thought about writing a, a, a naming tool to, to name the cluster because you have to somehow have this in DNS, you have to have it in HashiCorp Vault or whatever you use for secrets. You have to somehow reflect that. You have it in your cluster management solution. Uh, you can come up with e using IATA codes, but that only goes so far. Somebody suggested to use the IKEA catalog naming because <laughs> <Like, No. laughs> they are short <laughs> names with no umlauts. Um, so that was a thing. But also cost, of course, is a, is a thing because all of a sudden you have to somehow uh, organize okay. all these different providers. And then even in, in, in on-prem settings, it's, it's a completely different um, oh, setup when you have hardware costs that you somehow have to translate into cost per use. So that, that becomes a very hard to navigate here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Peter, would you please share with us your thoughts on how to govern and integrate workloads distributed in different in infrastructure? And how can we have a consistent story and flow across those infrastructure? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a good question. The key to answer is <laughs> two, key, two words here. One is like abstraction, another one is like standardization. So uh, we need to take this like very complex problem and try to decompose this into like you know sub problems by providing abstractions of on the multiple le levels so starting from like the you know very low level so uh, we have like you know multiple um, data centers like multi cloud uh, on premises potentially uh, that we want to connect together uh, and we need like a secure we need like you know a reliable we need a high bandwidth, uh, high throughput solution for that. Uh, and to ensure that like, you know, the private network from one data center from one entity is like, you know, uh, has an ability to talk uh, together, to, to talk to the private network from the other entity. Uh, so for example, at Google, we have like uh, a couple of solutions here. Like one is like various flavors of interconnect solutions. We have like cloud VPN. With those things in place, we are bringing, you know, all those distant entities into like, you know, the single, uh, single place from like, you know, logical perspective. They're like, you know, now uh, working together, like they're closer together. Yes. Uh, then there is still like, you know, different infrastructure uh, in in all those solutions. They are connected together, but like the infrastructure that is is different. So. Uh, Kubernetes is, of course, like an answer for, like, you know, abstracting the infrastructure, providing, like, a consistent and unified API for deploying applications, deploying workloads uh, on top of, like, you know, various infrastructures uh, 
um, various like you know inf various like you know flavors of the infrastructure different uh, 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 heterogeneous infrastructure across like you know multiple data centers yes and then on top of that uh, there is like service mesh layer that offers a um, solution for abstracting the services uh, level uh, uh, abstracting like you know the services uh, the various applications like offering uh, you know, secure, offering like, you know, observable um, solution uh, for, for uh, you know, abstracting those problems. I see that we are getting out of the time, so yeah. <laughs> I try to keep it short. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Piotr. So thank you all for the great discussion, but I would love to get final thoughts from each one of you. And let's start by Roland, please. Um, yeah, so if you... If you have a hybrid situation, the multiple clouds, multiple data center in the mix, etc. Um, yeah, the connectivity and the, and the security uh, uh, challenges that you have are, uh, are probably uh, solved with using uh, one of the, the open source uh, service measures that are available. So don't be scared of them. <laughs> I would say, well, start small and, and build out from there. Thank you, Ricardo. Yeah, so I, I, will, I will also mention that, um, is that we all have similar uh, use cases and um, we have this opportunity of uh, being in a huge community and being able to work together uh, instead of solving our own problems in the corner. So the best, uh, the best solution for everyone is to, to continue doing this uh, as we are, which is to gather from time to time in uh, conferences like this. And, uh, and make sure that we all push uh, for, for our own use cases, but in a, in a coordinated, grouped way. Thank you, Ricardo. Peter? So uh, I want to echo um, what, what, what you just said. Uh, running services in a multi-cloud and multi uh, hybrid environment, doing this in a secure way is like a tough problem. And it cannot be solved in isolation by you know one person, one company, one entity, uh, because like you know it's a distributed problem. Nobody has a control on that. So uh, I'm super happy that you know we are having like the open source community. We are having like CNCF that that, that are like facilitating the work in that space. There is already a lot of great stuff that is in place, like Kubernetes. Um, service mesh is your gateway, uh, plenty of other things, uh, and more great things to come over the next couple of years, for sure. Thank you, Peter. Christian? Uh, yeah, I think there is a diverse set of solutions. The only thing that you should really do is to ask, uh, why am I going hybrid multi-cloud cluster, whatever? <laughs> and is it really re required? But if you say yes, and if you have a very good reason, then, as said, the community can cover you. Thank you. Thank you. So I hope that you enjoyed the discussion today. And uh, just to close, it's a matter of um, patterns. We don't have one single magical solution for everything. But always ask why, as Christian mentioned. Also uh, check the contribution and contribute in the use cases within the community. And definitely enjoy it to the max. <laughs> and with that, I would like to uh, just ask you uh, if you have any questions. Uh, please, uh, we are open to really answer any questions to have. And also, please uh, give us your feedback. It always matters for us. Thank you.